Today I'm beginning a two-part series with you concerning the second coming of Christ. Would you bow your hearts together with me in prayer? Father, we thank you for the wonderful assurance that you are coming again. And as we begin this two-part series on the soon return of your son, I'm offering myself as a vessel of fresh and new into your hands at this very moment. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight so that your purpose, your design purpose for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective might be accomplished. Because this pray, pray, and praises for victories I give in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. After graduating from Bible college and serving as a pastor for a year, the Pentecostal denomination of which I was a minister invited me to teach at its Bible college. At that time, I began a detailed study in prophecy and found myself forced to make a major doctrinal decision in my search for truth. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. The study of Daniel's 70 weeks was of great interest because the denomination of which I was a member was divided over the location of the 70th week. In my study, I discovered that an overwhelming majority of commentators I researched agreed that the 490-year period known as Daniel's 70 weeks began around 457 B.C. But many disagreed as to when it would end. The general consensus was that the first 69 weeks were consecutive and ended around 27 A.D. But there were a number of interpretations that were applied to the 70th or to the final week. Here are the four interpretations I discovered. Number one, some identified the 70th week with the time of Antiochus Epiphanes. Secondly, some with that of Titus the Roman general. Third, many with that of a future Antichrist. And number four, a few with that of the earthly ministry of Jesus. And so it seemed that my first task was to identify the central personality of Daniel's 70th week because much of the contention revolved around Daniel 9:27 and the he who was to confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Perhaps I need to share with you what I had been taught and what I had taught others up to the time of my search for truth in this area. It was and still is the view held by the majority of the Christian world. It went like this and goes like this. Jesus is soon to secretly rapture or catch away his church, and the wicked will be left upon the earth. An antichrist will rise to power and make a covenant with many for the final week of Daniel 70. In the middle of this last week, the seven-year period, the antichrist will break the covenant, and demand that his mark of 666 be accepted by all. Anyone who refuses to accept what is called the mark of the beast will be denied the opportunity to buy and sell 
and eventually be placed under the penalty of death. Anyone who stands for Jesus during that time will actually be saved. And his or her name, his or her faith, will secure a place in heaven. At the end of the seven-year Great Tribulation period, Jesus will visibly return with the saints from heaven and fight the battle of Armageddon where the enemy will be defeated. That's what I had been taught and what I have been teaching for years. And so I repeat, it seemed my first task was to identify the central personality of the 70th week of Daniel because much of the contention revolved around Daniel 9.27 and the who and the he who would confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. As I studied Daniel 9, verses 24 through 27, I discovered that the he of verse 27 could refer only to one of two personalities. Number one, the Messiah mentioned in verse number 26, or secondly, the desolator prince also mentioned in verse 26, who would lead in destroying the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary. In researching each of the four possibilities that I mentioned just a few moments ago to discover the central figure of Daniel's 70th week, it became apparent, very apparent, that the he of verse 27 could not be Antiochus Epiphanes. Even though Antiochus Epiphanes was a prince who persecuted the Jews and desecrated the altar by offering an unclean animal on that altar, Antiochus Epiphanes died in 163 B.C. And the 70th week of Daniel would have to be after 27 A.D., because Daniel 9, verses 25 and 26, speak of the Messiah coming on the scene at the end of that first 69-week period, and the Antichrist would have to appear after the Christ. Makes logical sense, doesn't it? I also had to eliminate the Roman general Titus, who was the son of Emperor Vespasian. While it was true that Rome fought a lengthy war against Jerusalem, that war cannot be deemed or regarded as a confirming of a covenant, especially when an estimated one million people fell victim to the horror of that siege. Also, Daniel 9.27, as we're going to notice as we get into the study, says that in the midst or in the middle of the week, the sacrifice and oblation would cease. And Titus, that Roman general, did not destroy the temple in Jerusalem until the end of the war in 70 A.D. As I investigated the possibility of a future Antichrist being the he of Daniel 9.27, I felt right at home. I felt right at home because, as I stated earlier, this was the interpretation I had been taught in Bible college and I had been teaching to others for years. This interpretation, those who hold to this interpretation believe very strongly that Daniel 9, 27 speaks of a future Antichrist. 
a future Antichrist who will gain dominion during the great tribulation period of seven years, which according to this teaching are ushered in by a secret rapture or a secret aspect of Christ's second advent. Now, according to this teaching, there is an indeterminate time span, and follow me very closely, there is an indeterminate time span between the 69th week that ended in 27 AD and it's called the gap theory or the age of the Gentiles. So there is this indeterminate time span between the end of the 69th week in 27 AD and the 70th week of Daniel. I found some real inconsistencies with that because I came to some definite conclusions about this interpretation, and I want to share one with you. This teaching that I have just shared with you was actually developed by a Jesuit priest. His name was Ribera, and Ribera published this theory around 1580. A.D. And why did he publish this theory? He did it in an attempt to turn the ears away from the accusations that were being made by the reformers. And what was the accusation being made by the reformers? They were advocating that the Roman Catholic papacy was the Antichrist. And so this Jewish, I mean, this Jesuit priest developed this theory so as to turn the attention away from this proclamation. It was alarming. It was alarming for me to discover that the majority of the Protestant Christian world follows unknowingly a teaching that was developed and proposed by the Roman Catholic Church and does not even realize whose teaching they are supporting. That was amazing to me. That was alarming to me. As I allowed Scripture to interpret other Scripture, I saw nothing in the Bible nothing at all, that even remotely hints at there being a gap in the fulfillment of Daniel's 70 weeks. But rather, the Bible teaches that the 70 weeks of Daniel are consecutive. They flow without a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week. And I still remember sharing what I was discovering with a fellow minister a few weeks after reaching this conclusion. Before I could finish relating my findings, he looked at me and asked with a scowl on his face, Dan, what are you doing? Are you turning your back? On everything you have been taught and everything you have been teaching for years? I smiled, looked at him and responding, I'm just turning my face to God's word and what God's word wants to teach me. By now, there was but one interpretation left to investigate. The one that takes the position that the he of Daniel 9.27 refers to the Messiah and not to the Antichrist. This teaching had the least amount of support among commentators. But this did not deter me because I had already learned a very valuable lesson. 
Follow me closely. Just because a majority subscribes to a particular position does not necessarily make it true. And just because a minority holds a certain view does not necessarily make it false. I'm convicted in my intellect and I'm convinced in my emotions of a very important principle. You see, my study had taught me a very valuable lesson. A Christian can avoid much confusion by just staying within the confine of God's word. Don't add to it. Don't take away. Just stay in God's word. This fourth interpretation is the one that I discovered to be biblical. To show that the he of Daniel 9.27 is indeed the Messiah and not referring to Antichrist, let's briefly examine the previous three verses and then tie all four together. I want you to follow me very closely. Because as we do, we will discover that the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy pointed out the first advent of the Messiah and even predicted his death and his supreme sacrifice. So let's go to verse 24. Verse 24 mentions six facets of the drama of redemption. Six facets related both to the purpose and the resulting consequences of the Jewish probationary period of 70 prophetic weeks or 490 literal years. Listen. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision of the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Did you get that? Now, let's take a look at each one of these six facets. Number one, to finish the transgression. Between the return from Babylonian captivity and the rejection of the Messiah, the Jewish nation would have one final opportunity to cooperate with God's divine plan of blessing all nations through them. But they refused that opportunity. And so because they refused that opportunity, when the 490 years ended, the Jewish nation forfeited the privilege of being God's one true spiritual vineyard. And as a result, the Gentiles received an opportunity to be grafted into God's family. Second facet of the drama of redemption was to make an end of sins. The word translated sins here can refer either to sins or to sin offerings. And it's very possible that both meanings apply here to show the twofold significance of the Messiah's first advent. Third facet of the drama of redemption, to make reconciliation for iniquity or to make atonement. When the Messiah died, he provided reconciliation. Reconciliation for anyone who accepts the offering of himself as the ultimate sacrifice for iniquity. Facet number four. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Since the giving of the promise recorded in Genesis 3 and verse 15, the Messiah had been the subject of man's expectation and faith. 
And when Jesus the Messiah offered himself for the sins of mankind, when he rose from the dead, he made it possible for anyone, for whosoever believes in him, to receive his robe of righteousness and to stand in God's sight as though sin had never been present on the record. Fifth facet of the drama of redemption was to seal up the vision and prophecy. Or to finish, if you will, or confirm. Daniel's prophecy, Daniel's vision, and all other prophecies of the Messiah's first advent were fulfilled and sealed as we are told in John 19 in verse 30, while hanging on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. And when Jesus spoke those three words, he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And at that moment, the vision and prophecy was sealed. Sixth facet of the drama of redemption, to anoint the most holy, literally meaning to anoint something most holy. This phrase is used in the Bible to characterize both things and places. When Jesus died, do you remember what happened in the temple? The Bible says when Jesus said it's finished, bowed his head and gave up the ghost, God stretched down his hand from heaven and tore the veil in that temple from top to bottom. And when God did that, God was signifying that no longer would he accept sacrifices offered upon an altar. And at the moment of Christ's death, the services in the earthly sanctuary came to an end in the divine scheme of things. And when Jesus rose from the dead, when Jesus ascended back to heaven after his resurrection, a sacrifice far better than the blood of, of animals, the precious blood of Jesus himself, the testator of the New Testament anointed the heavenly sanctuary. Now verse 25. You see, verse 25 tells us exactly when the Messiah's first advent would take place. At the end of the 69th week. Listen closely. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem until the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks or 69 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. The Bible and history relates that in the autumn of 27 AD, exactly 483 years after the commandment given by Artaxerxes in 457 B.C., which began the 70-week period, Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River and began his public ministry. And as Jesus came up out of that baptismal experience, the Bible says the Holy Spirit of God in the form of a dove rested upon him and he received a special anointing for the task ahead. The first 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy brought the world to 27 A.D. And fresh from the baptismal waters of the Jordan River and the triumphant victory in the wilderness of temptation, I want you to listen very carefully to a proclamation from the gracious lips of the Messiah preserved in Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
And as if someone were about to ask, well, why is the Spirit of the Lord upon you? Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach, underscore, the acceptable year of the Lord. Listen again as Jesus spoke these words in Mark 1 and verse 15. Underscore. The what? The time is what? The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And then later, the apostle Paul revealed his awareness of the prophetic timetable when he penned on the Holy Spirit inspiration, Galatians 4 and verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son. What is this time that Jesus is referring to? What is this time that Paul referred to? The time mentioned by both Jesus and Paul was the definite time event predicted in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. How can I know this? How can I be sure? Because the 69 weeks are the only prophetic time period that ends with the coming of the Messiah, the Prince. Now let's go to verse 26. Because verse 26 leaves no room to doubt concerning the death of Christ. Listen. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not of himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. After Jesus began his public ministry, he marched, he walked in only one direction, toward the crucifixion cross. The angel Gabriel had told Daniel hundreds of years before that the Messiah's death shall take place. And my brothers and sisters, all of history hinges on this dynamic truth. From the beginning to the end, the Bible is consistent to present this one fact. Echoed loud and long in Revelation 13 and verse 8. The Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All of history hinges on this fact. And when Jesus was baptized by John in the waters of the Jordan River, Jesus entered with the Jewish people into a final week of the 70. A seven-year period that would set the stage for everything that has followed since then. The Messiah would suffer to fulfill what was written in Scripture about him. His suffering and his death would be a substitute for whosoever would accept its vicarious merits. And thank God that I became one of those. Thank God that you have become one of those. What a wonderful message of hope. When Jesus entered into that final week with the Jewish people, it was very special. And when Jesus was rejected, and Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem. The destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary was inevitable. And each moment drew them closer to the hour when a flaming torch thrown by a Roman soldier in 70 A.D. would fulfill Daniel 9.26. Now let's tie it all together in verse 27. Because verse 27 establishes the exact time for the Messiah to be cut off. 
and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, it's very important that you understand something here. When you read Daniel 9, 26, what you are seeing is a general portrait of Daniel's 70th week and its results. A general portrait. But when you read Daniel 9, 27, you are seeing a specific portrait. It narrows down. Verse 26, a general portrait. Verse 27, a specific portrait. It repeats itself in different language. Now, the Bible does this often, doesn't it? In the book of Revelation, we will see it explained here and then repeated in another place. And so this is what happens in Daniel 9, 26 and 27. The Bible teaches that at the end of the 69 weeks, in the autumn of 27 AD, at the time of his baptism, the Messiah confirmed the covenant for one prophetic week, or seven literal years. This seventh week extended from 27 AD until 34 AD. In a final effort to establish the Jewish people as a nation through whom God could bless all the inhabitants of the earth, Jesus, the author of the covenant, we're told in John 1 and verse 11, came unto who? He came unto his own. Did they receive him? No. The Bible says in John 1 and verse 11, he came unto his own and his own received him not. Now listen to Jesus as he spoke to the disciples about their early missionary outreach. It's found in Matthew 5, 10, verses 5 and 6. Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans into you not, but rather go to who? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. What is Jesus saying? I am entering into a covenant with the children of Israel. We are entering into Daniel's 70th week, the seven-year period that is very, very, very important. But the house of Israel would not enter into a covenant relationship. In fact, in 31 A.D., three and a half years after Jesus began his public ministry, they crucified the Messiah. And in doing so, they fulfilled exactly what the angel told Daniel would happen. In the midst, in the middle of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. That's exactly what happened, my brothers and sisters. After three and a half years of public ministry, Jesus was cut off. The Messiah was cut off. He gave himself as the supreme sacrifice that fulfilled the symbolism associated with the sacrificial system. And he brought that sacrificial system to an end that might seem dark and dismal. But there is a message of hope because God will have a people. And because God will have a people, the Gentiles were given an opportunity to become a part of God's family. And at the end of the 70 prophetic weeks, at the end of 490 literal years, in 34 A.D., three 
and one half years after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, our Lord called a special ambassador, a special ambassador who was to go to the Gentile world. And his name was Paul. I want you to listen to the Apostle Paul as he would later make this testimony of how now God's people would include in Romans 10 and verse 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. The Apostle also penned in Galatians 3 beginning in verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For we are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What a wonderful message of hope. That, my friends, is the purpose of Daniel's 70 weeks. So that you and I can be a part of God's family. In closing, part one of this two-part series, I want us to take a summary look at Daniel's 70 weeks. The 490-year probation period for the Jews began in 457 B.C. And the first 69 weeks ended with Christ's baptism in 27 A.D. At that time, the Messiah, the He of Daniel 9.27 entered the confirming process of the last week of Daniel 70. In the middle of that week, after three and one-half years of ministry, Christ was crucified. For three and a half more years, the gospel was shared just with the Jews. That last week, the seventh week of Daniel's prophecy ended in 34 A.D. It ended with the call of Paul to the Gentile world. And at that time, the Jews forfeited their privilege to be known as God's one favored person and people. Now, I'm about to make a statement I hope will not offend anyone we are to pray for everyone. We agree with me on that? Amen. Jew and Gentile. We're to pray for everyone. But my brothers and sisters, the Jewish nation is no longer the one favored people of God. Amen. And sadly, some Christians are getting caught up in this and missing a tremendous blessing to both Jew and and Gentile. You see, I discovered in my search for truth that Daniel's seventh week is not a future seven-year tribulation period. Daniel's seventh week is in the past, but its significance still touches the lives of everyone who lives in the present, whether Jew or Gentile, and lets us know that God's grace is not just for a one people, but God's grace is available for everyone. <laughs> and through faith in Jesus Christ, the Messiah, through faith in the essential personality of the 70th week, you and I can look to the future with assurance and be ready for the soon return of Jesus. And in our next session, we're going to look in greater detail regarding the idea of a secret rapture. And we will allow the Bible and not tradition to be the source for our search for truth. 
Father God, thank you for your word, your word that is so plain. If we will just allow your word to be what you intended for it to be. And Father, I ask that each of us, as we consider the second coming of Jesus, will make sure through your grace that we're ready to meet you with clean hands and pure hearts. Because this pride pray and praises for victories I give. In Jesus' name, amen.